Today I'd like to speak about heroic failure. A word that we've seen a lot in our headlines over the last year or so is hero. This perhaps somewhat old-fashioned word has come back into regular use as the media refer to our NHS heroes tackling the coronavirus head-on, our key worker heroes who are risking their own health and working hard to keep the country up and running. In the recent inquiry into the Manchester Arena bombing, we have heard tales of everyday people showing great courage and performing heroic deeds to help complete strangers that were caught up in the blast. And of course, we have all been deeply saddened by the death of Captain Sir Tom Moore. Captain Tom was, for us, a local boy, having been educated just down the road from Giggleswick at Keithley Grammar School. Captain Tom has quite rightly been hailed a hero for his walks that raised over £32 million for NHS charities. He was pictured on the front of every newspaper under the headline, Captain Tom, the best of us. And when we hear his name, I'm sure that we can all quickly bring an image to mind. I wonder if the same can be said if we heard names such as Ernest Shackleton, Amelia Earhart, Jim Lovell, George Mallory and Robert Falcon Scott. What, if any, image comes into our mind when we hear those names? What is it that makes a hero in the true sense of the word? And what are the traits of today's heroes? How might these match up with some of the heroes from the past? And how long might their heroic legacy be remembered? Albert Einstein said, If you have never failed, you have never tried anything new. Today we are bombarded by images of success. We see pictures of happy, successful people. And we are prompted to think that success is the only outcome that has any true worth. But as Miss Wood is always keen to remind us, teachers and students alike, we need to be prepared to fail, particularly when we are learning something new or pushing the limits of our ability. To fail, F-A-I-L, is nothing more than our first attempt in learning. Or, to put it another way, when we fail, we are forever acquiring important lessons. Every generation has its heroes, and what each generation sees as the perfect heroic attributes changes from era to era and from culture to culture. In ancient Greece, Odysseus, the hero of Homer's epic work, the Odyssey, is portrayed as having strength, courage, nobility, confidence in his own authority, a sharp intellect and a thirst for personal glory. By the Middle Ages, in works such as Beowulf, the eponymous hero is shown as having the qualities of valour, military prowess, loyalty, generosity and honour. The hero of this age was a man who fights because he must fight for the survival of his people, but also one who was aware of his own mortality. But even so, he never shies away from threat or peril. To do so would be unheroic. Indeed, it is this very attitude that in the end leads to many of the heroes of this period being defeated and even killed. Victorian culture showed great respect for national heroes, whether they were dead or alive, and they particularly honoured heroism in military campaigns and in social action through acts of altruism and charity, but they particularly valued bravery shown when exploring new and unknown lands. In the post-war era, we were again encouraged to honour those who had demonstrated their heroism through acts of valour in combat, and, to a large extent, this still forms the basis for many of our concepts of the heroic. Just observe the ritual at the tomb of the unknown soldier held daily at Arlington National Cemetery in Virginia, USA. For some, heroes are those who face up to the challenges of life and those who are ultimately successful in all their pursuits. But there is another kind of hero. Those whose drive to succeed, whose drive to push the boundaries of human knowledge, human experience and human endeavour inevitably lead to failure, injury and sometimes even death. In a world where we can trick ourselves into believing that the answer to everything is just at the touch of a keyboard, it's sobering to remember that, although all of the Earth's surface has been at least to some extent mapped and photographed, there are still vast expanses of land yet to be fully explored by humans. And when it comes to the ocean floor, we have only accurately mapped around 5% of it. This means there is around 65% of the Earth unexplored. It is this area of heroic effort, exploration, that I want to focus our attention on for the next few minutes. Robert Falcon Scott was born on the 6th of June 1868, 
and, at the age of 13, having passed his entry examinations, he began his naval career as a cadet on board the training ship HMS Britannia. In 1887, a few months before his 21st birthday, Conn, as he was known to his friends, met the secretary of the Royal Geographical Society, Clements Markham. It was this meeting that eventually led Conn becoming the leader of the Discovery Expedition in the southern polar regions in 1901. Also on this same expedition was one Ernest Shackleton, but more of him later. During this polar exploration, Scott, along with Shackleton and Edward Wilson, embarked on a long exploratory journey towards the Pole. On the 30th of December 1902, they reached latitude 82 degrees 17 seconds south, about 530 miles from the Pole itself. At the time, this was the farthest south a human had ever travelled, and Scott's new record beat the previous best by over 230 miles. Scott returned from the south and was hailed a hero. He was awarded medals and honour and gained promotion to the rank of captain. He was even invited to meet the king. Scott then re-enlisted with the navy and was given command of his own ship. While Scott continued with his naval career, Shackleton looked to return to the southern polar region and in 1907 he led the Nimrod expedition with the aim of being the first man to reach the South Pole. On the 26th of November 1908, Shackleton celebrated passing Scott's previous record and he pressed on to come to within 112 miles of the Pole, arriving there on January the 9th, 1908. He then had to turn back because supplies were running low and he was concerned for the safety of his men. When Scott learnt of Shackleton's return from the south without reaching the Pole, he determined that he would get there himself and he set about planning another expedition to press on deeper into unknown territory. In 1910, he set out on what became known as the Terra Nova Expedition. In his planning and preparation, Scott was not afraid to try out new techniques and new technology. His expedition was the first to make use of motorised vehicles on the polar continent and he looked to use a combination of ponies, dogs and human muscle power to achieve his goal of reaching the South Pole. As Scott was setting off on his attempt to get to the South Pole, so too was the Norwegian explorer Roald Amundsen. And the press of the day, much as they would do today, made a big deal of this apparent competition. The race to the Pole captured the human imagination. For the men themselves, the main drive was not the race against each other, but the heroic endeavour to overcome the tough terrain, the fierce weather, and of course the lure of the unknown, the true heroic traits valued at the time. Scott began his journey south on the 1st of November, Amundsen having set out almost two weeks earlier on the 19th of October. Both expeditions employed very different techniques and equipment. Amundsen chose to use Inuit furred skin clothing that was both warm and lightweight. Scott used traditional heavy furs. Amundsen made use of dog teams and skis, while Scott used a mixture of dog teams, ponies, tractors and man hauling. As it turned out, Amundsen's two-week head start proved crucial, as it meant that he and his men missed some of the truly terrible weather that Scott and his team encountered, with temperatures dropping below minus 40 degrees and winds well over 100 miles per hour. Amundsen and his team reached the pole on the 14th of December 1911, becoming the first humans ever to do so. They left a tent there containing a note with details of their achievement, and then made the return journey. The entire team successfully made it back to base camp on the 25th of January 1912. Scott's team, on the other hand, had had a torrid time, making slow progress with their heavy equipment and in the face of very poor weather. They arrived at the pole on the 17th of January, only to find that they had been beaten to it. They found the erected tent and note left by Amundsen. In the face of such grave disappointment, these five men had the prospect of 862 miles, or 1,387 kilometres, to trek home, in the knowledge that they had failed. They had not been the first men to reach 90 degrees south. Just before setting out, Scott wrote in his diary, I am afraid the return journey is going to be dreadfully tiring and monstrous. Initially, the journey went well, but as the men tired, things started to get tough. One of the team, Edgar Evans, fell and was injured, and 13 days later, on the 17th of February, he fell again and died. 
the remaining men still faced a further 400 miles of Antarctic travel, and as they continued, they could feel their strength waning. At each supply cache left on their outward journey, they found the fuel that they had left, vital for thawing out their meagre supplies, was much less than anticipated. Unknown to the men, the freezing temperatures had damaged the leather seals on the fuel containers, and much of it had been lost through evaporation and leakage. After struggling on for two weeks, walking on frostbitten feet, another member of the party succumbed. Captain Lawrence Edward Grace Titus Oates, knowing that his slow progress was putting the lives of the remaining three men at risk, uttered the now immortal words, I'm just going outside, and maybe some time. After which he struggled to his swollen feet, left the tent, and walked away to his death. This act of self-sacrifice, giving the remaining party members the very best chance of survival. Scott and his men managed to walk, stagger and crawl a further 20 miles, but then exhaustion and a fierce blizzard forced them to make camp. The men, resigned to their fate, wrote letters of farewell to their families, and Scott made his final diary entry ten days later. This entry, dated the 29th of March, read, Last entry. For God's sake, look after our people. All three men died in that tent. They were just twelve and a half miles, twenty short kilometres away from a cache they had left that contained around one tonne of food, fuel and other vital supplies. On the face of it, the expedition was an abject failure. The party did not make it to the pole first, and all members perished during the return journey. However, when the world learned the fate of Scott and his men, it roused a sense of national pride. Robert Baden-Powell, founder of the Scout Movement, wrote... Are Britons going downhill? No, there is plenty of spirit left. Captain Scott and Captain Oates have shown us that. The survivors of the expedition were awarded polar medals on their return home, and many of those who were in the military also received promotions. In response to Scott's final diary entry, a charitable fund was set up, and it raised over £7.5 million in today's money to support survivors of the expedition. Dozens of memorials, plaques and monuments have been set up to Scott, both in Britain and around the world. Despite failing to be the first to the pole, and his failure to return home safe and well with all his men, Scott, Oates, Wilson, Bowers and Evans were all hailed as great heroes of their day. Even in their failure, the public saw something positive in their endeavour, in their spirit of adventure and in their determination. Ernest Shackleton would continue in his adventurous pursuits, and in doing so, he lost his ship, the Endurance. He then endured unimaginable hardship marooned on ice floes for over two months. He then had to embark on a 520 nautical mile crossing of the dangerous southern oceans in just a small open boat to reach South Georgia and thereby initiate the rescue of his remaining stranded crew. Shackleton was set to return to the southern polar continent, but he fell ill and on the 5th of January 1922, he died. Amelia Earhart found fame as a daring pilot, and she was the first female to fly solo across the Atlantic. She set many new records for flying and was an advocate for women in aviation. She went missing during one of the legs of her attempt to fly around the world. Her plane and her body have never been found, and she was presumed killed. Jim Lovell was the module commander of the ill-fated Apollo 13 moon mission. The craft never made it to the moon, so in that respect the mission was a failure. However, through great teamwork, both in the spacecraft and through the ground crew, human ingenuity meant that all of the three crew members were able to return safely to Earth. George Mallory was another successful explorer, adventurer and climber. He was last seen just 245 metres below the summit of Mount Everest with his climbing partner, Sandy Irvin. It is not known if they ever made it to the top. If they did, they would have been the first to do so, beating Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay by almost 30 years. The bodies of Mallory and Irvin were found 75 years later, and there was some tantalising hints that they may have reached the summit, but no conclusive proof. All these heroes have one thing in common. They tried to achieve something new. They tried to push the limits of human endurance, human exploration and human achievement. And in the process, they experienced failure. And in some cases, like that of Scott and his team, they died in the attempt. 
but those who have followed in their footsteps have gone on to achieve even bigger, better things, thanks to these pioneers. Those who try something new and fail should not be viewed as failures, but as pioneers who had the courage to try, to try and expand our human experience and knowledge, and it is on their shoulders that we stand today. When we choose our role models and heroes in this generation, I hope that we look back on our choices in the years to come, and even if we see that our heroes have failed in some of their achievements, that we can see that their lives were worthy of the title hero.